get straight on now and say we've got this presentation, um, which looks really interesting. Uh, mainstream and mainstream and niche innovation e-cargo bikes. And I work a lot in Sweden where there are where they've become actually incredibly popular. Um, so it's really going to be good to hear about these. There are three speakers here. Um, uh, there's uh, Graeme Sheriff, who's um, based in, in Salford, just down the road from where I am in Manchester. We've got Luke Boisier-Feski. I think I pronounced that slightly incorrectly there, so I do apologise, Luke, um, who's also from Salford, and Nicholas Davis, who's from Caledonian um, University in Glasgow. So they're the three speakers. Um, hopefully the slides are on your screen now. So I'll go straight over and say, uh, um, on with you then, Graeme. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. And thanks to everyone for attending this session. Um, as Kevin said, we're going to talk about e-cargo bikes um, from the point of view of mainstreaming the innovation. And we want to contextualise these using the multi-level perspective framework. Um, this is a study that we conducted uh, last year in Greater Manchester. So it's based on uh, some interviews and focus groups in, in Greater Manchester. Um, and now I'm going to try and slide you out here. Um, what are e-cargo bikes? Um, these um, images should give a good idea what they are. They're not, they're not new, but I think that the more recent development has been the e-element and the, the kind of improvement in the, in the motorised element of them. So you have an electric assist motor with them. Um, what that means is that they can now be used for carrying kind of heavier goods over longer distances uh, without the requirement for kind of a lot of physical fitness, which means they open up to a much um, wider range of use cases, which can include logistics and deliveries as shown here, or also as, as shown on the right, uh, family and group use. And also for people who, for whatever reason, wouldn't be able to uh, ride a conventional two-wheel bike, um, these can be very useful as well. Um, before we come back to cargo bikes, I want to introduce the multi-level perspective. And this diagram may well be familiar to, to many of you. Um, it's a, a, a concept, a tool that's been developed by GEALS within the field of social technical um, or sustainable transitions. And it um, relies on three levels, the landscape, uh, which is a kind of relatively stable policy and cultural landscape, um, regimes, which are more likely to change, but at a slower rate to the landscape, and then niches, uh, which are new ideas and new concepts and new practices that kind of bubble up from the bottom um, and influence the, the development of the regimes. Um, so in, in producing this, uh, this research and in, in, in finalising the paper that we're, we're currently uh, finishing off, uh, we've applied the multi-level perspective to, to transport and to e-cargo bikes in particular. Um, a number of authors have done this with transport and there's different ways of interpreting it. And what we found with the NLP is that people tend to present it slightly differently depending on what they're looking at, whether that be electricity generation or food or in this case transport. So. One of the features of the transport uh, landscape is the landscape, confusingly, it's the physical landscape, so the built environment, which I guess tends to change relatively slowly and frustratingly slowly, I guess, for some, some, some of us. Um, but also um, um, the kind of, the thing that maybe we can see changing now is the recognition of climate change and public health in relation to transport. Um, and whilst many of these um, factors are relatively slowly changing, actually what we've seen last year is a shock to the landscape, which is quite a, an unusual thing to happen, which is COVID-19. And that's, that was sort of literally out of the blue uh, and produced unexpected changes. And one of the unexpected changes uh, is, for example, a reluctance to use public transport during a pandemic, an increase in walking and cycling, an increase in reliance on internet shopping. And all of those things have a, have a, bearing, to, to have a bearing on e-cargo bike use. So it's very interesting to think about how the landscape has changed quite radically, uh, the landscape that, that could accommodate um, e-cargo bikes. Um, and researchers have generally agreed that the, the dominant regime within transport is automobility, which is characterised by cars, vans, lorries, fossil fuel powered vehicles. Um, and it's, it's stabilised by the, the kind of well-established road infrastructure, professional practices, personal habits, the, the established fuel networks, um, all of those things combined to make the regime stable in a, in a sense it's harder to do alternative things. 
Um, and we would say that there's a sub-regime within that automobility regime that is fossil fuel of logistics. So it's, it's sort of vans and the lorries element of it. And it's also stabilized by those expectations that this is the way we do things, that the, the, the white van is the dominant technology, but also expectations around things like just-in-time networks in, in manufacturing and in distribution. So that, 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 that we do things because this is how we do them. Um, and there's a, a, another sub element, which some people argue is a niche, but uh, we would say it's, it's developing so rapidly now, it's becoming part of the regime, which is electric and hybrid vehicles. And that's clearly very relevant for e-cargo bikes. And there's some disagreement then where active travel would go on this. Um, Giels has argued that this is a um, subaltern regime um, to indicate that it's, it's kind of sub, subordinate to the the automobility regime. We've been using the term contender, a contender regime, because we see it as kind of increasing in, in dominance and we hope becoming a much more stable part of the of the mobility uh, landscape as a whole, if I'm not mixing my terminology up there. Um, and finally, at the bottom, um, it's in the bottom in this scheme. It doesn't mean it's in the bottom in any other way, because it, if we were measuring in terms of carbon emissions, this might be at the top. At the bottom, we've got e-cargo bikes. Um, and the rest of the presentation, we want to talk about how we can understand these as a niche. So they're a niche level innovation that are developing and there are potentials for them to be um, uh, accommodated within the existing uh, regimes. And we want to argue, uh, we want to just remind people that the niche, the e-cargo bike niche isn't operating in isolation. Um, these are very closely connected with other developments such as, for example, micromobility, which might relate to uh, sharing vehicles or hubs for things like e-cargo bikes. And also another example is low traffic neighborhoods and other, and other schemes that are trying to improve the built environment so it's more accommodating of cycling and, and therefore e-cargo bikes. So we want to emphasize that those niches are also part of understanding e-cargo bikes as a niche. So I, I hope that was a useful um, exploration of the multi-level perspective. And to talk more about what we found out in our research and relate this to the multi-level perspective, I'd like to hand over to Luke now. Thanks, Graham. Just wait for that slide to come up. As, as Graham has just sort of um, very well outlined there, we're defining e-cargo bikes in the multi-level perspective as a niche technology. Um, as was mentioned, e-cargo bikes aren't necessarily new technology, but the emphasis on that niche innovation aspect that we want to focus on here is the e-mobility part, the electric assist motor, because this opens up cargo bikes not only to a new audience, but also potentially to a whole new level of operation when it comes to distance traveled or uh, the amount of load that can be moved around. And so in this research, we did a series of interviews and focus groups to try and understand the potential and the current use cases of e-cargo bikes for various different um, forms of operations. Uh, next slide, please, Graham. So well, some of the examples of new cases that we found is that we spoke to people who uh, saw potential for them to be used on university campuses, sort of enclosed, um, enclosed, sort of easy, easy to manage sites. Um, we also found, sorry, Graham, I think the slides just changed. Can you bring it back to that? Fab, thanks. We also spoke to hospitals who said that they saw um, a huge um, potential for e-cargo bikes to be used on their sites in the form of moving heavy goods around but just within the hospital site itself which was currently being used by vans or fossil fuel vehicles. Food deliveries was um, a common subject that we talked about with food distributors or other courier services that were currently using e-cargo bikes and the challenge of keeping food warm on the bikes when um, compared to other forms of transport. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, large logistics sites, um, development, manufacturing sites where they have a huge need for moving fairly small to medium sized goods or tools or resources around again within those contained sites. They found, um, they, they thought there could be huge potential for cargo bikes in that particular environment. Uh, and of course, congested urban environments, overcoming that last mile challenge, um, which really is one of the biggest sort of um, potential use cases for e-cargo bikes. 
Um, and one of the reasons I think that we're seeing them continue to grow in popularity. Uh, next, next slide, please, Graham. So it's important to understand that when, when we, you introduce a niche into the multi-level perspective, this is an idea, an innovation that is effectively vying to become part of the regime. It's, becoming, it's vying to become part of the established way of doing things. And in order to do that, it has to carve out its own USP in order to fit in. It's got to find its own niche, as it were, to, to, to corner that part of the market and then grow from there potentially to maybe overthrow the current dominant regime. When a niche has to do that, it comes up to a certain amount of barriers because, as Graham mentioned, dominant regimes build the landscape and build the infrastructure around themselves to continue cultivating themselves to be successful. So if we take the automobility regime, for example, we think about roads and infrastructure for cars and goods vehicles and parking and all those kind of things. Um, it throws up certain barriers for potential alternative modes of transport to come into that space. So some of the niche level barriers we sort of found from talking to people um, one of them was looking at food logistics and how to keep things warm. Um, one of the people that we we're speaking to who is involved in a cargo by courier service said one of the main factors is hot food, making sure the food is hot uh, when it is at the point of delivery. And this is particularly challenging when you start looking at multiple drops. So rather than sort of taking one piece of hot food from one location to the next, when you start stacking up multiple deliveries, over time, ensuring that food stays warm is a challenge and, and something that the niche is sort of, uh, the niche of e-cargo bikes is currently facing. Um, the e-mobility is one of its biggest strengths and one of its sort of unique selling points, but it's also one of its challenges. Um, you've always got to remember to charge the battery, uh, make sure it's fully charged up, make sure that you plan your journey around the battery limitations um, because cycling a cargo bike without battery is no fun. And sort of balancing those sort of last mile deliveries in urban centers versus the longer distances. Um, one, of the, one of the contributors we spoke to said, you know, they had absolutely no complaints about them using in congested urban spaces around London, but they were getting a lot of interest from their business from um, clients from the outside. And they were saying they just couldn't find a viable way of using the bikes to cover those kind of distances. And therefore they started looking at an electric van. So whether or not there's potential future for the niche to a niche of e-cargo bikes to look at in, increasing distances to overcome some of these challenges. And next slide, please, Graham. Um, it's important to think about then how the, the niche relates to the regime um, and how it overcomes some of the current um, challenges that the regime faces, but then also thinking about some of the challenges it faces as a niche, not to get too lost in my own terminology. Um, thinking about traffic particularly, one participant noted that, you know, with e-cargo bikes, you can filter through traffic. And they said that essentially makes you traffic, traffic agnostic. You don't necessarily need to worry about rush hour, for example, because you can move through traffic freely. Um, but there are limitations to this freedom that have to be considered uh, and as one interviewee mentioned you know you might not have the massive capacity of a van you can't take everything that you want in one go this was particularly relevant for let's say medium to large size catering companies that were thinking about switching to e-cargo bikes because that would impact their entire production chain chain really sort of traditionally they could batch make all the food, put it all into the van, away they go. With cargo bikes, they'd have to look at doing smaller deliveries regularly back to back, which means the food might need to be produced in a slightly different way to accommodate that sort of delivery process. So sort of, it's not always just about the vehicle offering an alternative. It starts to feed into the sort of the wider production line of things as well, which, you know, is, is another opportunity to think how things can be made sustainable more broadly as well. Uh, next slide, please, Graham. Size came up as something that was really important. I just mentioned about the ability to filter through traffic. Um, one, one interviewee here was saying, you know, if you've got a big bike, um, one of the big cargo bikes, you know, because they can get quite large because some of the bigger bikes can carry quite a lot of stuff. Um, if you have a big bike or if you have someone that's not necessarily super comfortable filtering traffic, then they found that often you would find yourselves caught in traffic potentially because the bikes were so wide or so big or the 
cyclist was the, the rider wasn't necessarily confident enough to filter through traffic with the bigger bike that you were just effectively moving at the same speed as traffic anyway um, so not necessarily improving time efficiencies in some occasions and one of the couriers we spoke to said that their riders actually found that their riders shied away from taking the bigger bikes out for this exact reason and they are often opted to take the smaller e-cargo bikes out because they could be more maneuverable, they could navigate the streets much more effectively and weave between traffic and filter traffic, improving their delivery times. But as a byproduct of that choice, it meant that they had to do more deliveries because um, they couldn't take as much out as they could on the bigger bikes. Next slide, please, Graham. Uh, storage, and this is sort of where the, the idea of the, the dominant regime comes into it a little bit. Um, Storage is an ongoing challenge. Um, being able to make sure that you've got somewhere to store your e-cargo bike at the beginning and end of the journey is um, you know, a potential barrier for some people and quite an important one moving forward for the technology, I think. You know, we're all, you know, we live in a world now where we have driveways or on-street parking or car parks and everything is sort of designed quite, you know, in a dominant way for the automobile. Um, knowing that we can move the cargo bike from one side to another without encountering any issues is uh, an important one and infrastructure and the future of infrastructure is quite essential in this one and this will effectively allow riders to have the flexibility um, because you basically means you can take your um, you can take your bike right up to the door of where you're going you might not necessarily need to park around the corner or even park outside you can take your take your um, delivery right up to the door and that gives you the added flexibility when sort of moving goods around. Uh, next slide, please, Graham. Uh, and just a little bit more on the flexibility. There was someone making the point that, you know, you are able to sort of move these bikes through congested urban spaces a bit more freer than you can with automobiles. So, for example, you can do some shopping, put them in your bike, move your bike to another part of the city, do a little bit more shopping, put that in your bike and move on. Um, and again, that works on the other end of delivery spectrums as well, where, you know, you can just cycle up to a door, hand off one package, cycle up to the next door. And it just gives you that little bit more flexibility than uh, you would otherwise have. Um, and home storage, again, an ongoing challenge. Um, this a quote, this quote is from someone who had their own cargo bike, uses it for personal um, personal reasons. And they said, you know, um, cargo bikes, you need good parking, basically, to be able to consider having a cargo bike because they're big bikes they need somewhere to be safe they're you know they're, they're not um you know they are affordable for what they offer but for some people they're not particularly cheap either so you know you want to make sure that you can protect that bike and make sure that it's safe and so he thinks that uh you know that we need much more investment in the future of infrastructure around cycle routes in greater manchester uh, next slide please graham i think this is uh, the part of the presentation when i hand it over to my colleague nick Thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, actually, those. Could you just um, put the bullets up? Yeah, thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, I'm good, just going to take you through the last few slides, um, a few more quotes, and really just to talk about how things are going to change or could change. Um, and so the first quote here, it's some of those very obvious misperceptions of cycling in general. Um, basically, if we're pit pitching the car and vans as the dominant regime and e-cargo bikes as a niche um really what, what people are saying is that, that there's this perception of moving down almost stepping down to to switch from a van to an e-cargo bike um and this is also kind of with the second quote it's also surrounded by notions of comfort so ev everyone thinks that comfort is important when moving around and and that's no different for for even even for work um, and, and they're basically sort of saying that it's more comfortable to be in, in the van um, with that quote. Uh, but, but also it's important to understand what you might um, need to be able to move the niche into the regime as well. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the, to the original picture that Graham showed. Um, if you can move that one on, Graham. Yeah, so just all the different bits. That's great. So just to, just to take us back to the MLP and, and this is really how we're, we're picturing um, where the co cargo bikes can come in, uh, how they can become part of the, the regime. Uh, we feel as though it's, it's mainly that they'll be in the active travel space and perhaps 
Uh, if we're talking about the size of these different re regimes here, increase the size for active travel. And I've, I've been looking at some of the questions and comments coming in on the chat as well, and people saying it is about investing in, in the infrastructure. It's also investing in, in things that will help change the culture as well. Um, so next slide, please, Graham. I'm just going to round things off now. Yeah, just a few more quotes here as well. Um, from the interviews, uh, convenience, the first one is, it's all about convenience. Um, and if you if you can challenge that, then it's a way of bringing that niche um, in as a dominant mode. Uh, it's all really about, it's about carrots and sticks. And so for, the, for, for Manchester as an example, they're bringing in a clean air zone. Um, so that would be, you know, something that would be a, a thought of as perhaps a, a stick to to make people change from a uh, an e a van to an e cargo bike, um, particularly as it is the smaller businesses and the, the smaller van drivers that are likely to be penalised the most by this by this zone. Um, but also in terms of the carrots as well, um, the last quote talk, last quote talks about trailblazers um, and. Really, we need those pioneers. I think. I think e-cargo bikes need the pioneers to be able to show people that it is possible, and to be able to demonstrate that it's something that 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 can be used. I think quite a lot of the argument is to for people to understand how an e-cargo bike can be used for their business or for them as an individual. Um, last one, I think now, Graham. Okay, so just quickly, just to run through the conclusions. Um, we very much put e-cargo bikes as a niche in, in our model. Um, certainly, uh, we, we're looking in, in terms of how that might change in the future. Um, the dominant regime, as we said, with, with cars and, um, and all the infrastructure that goes with them, um, it, it, challenges, it challenges anything that, that's, that's trying to move into the regime level. Um, and so, in terms of the policy at the moment, the, the, the kind of the the, the, the the curious thing is that the policy at the landscape level actually it, it looks at things like climate change, air pollution, sustainability as being priorities. Um, E-cargo bikes very much resonate with all of those things. Um, but at the regime level, uh, it's a completely different case. It goes against um, joining up, up these um, and um, and then finally, also just to, just as a final word, really, um, niches they don't always remain niches for long. There is a, there is a way in which regime level actors can actually help niches to to become part of the of, of the regime. Uh, this is things like changing the culture, changing the infrastructure, um, and generally making a better a better place for e cargo cargo bikes to exist. Um, uh, final slide, I think. Yeah, yeah just to just to flag up, um, it's also in the chat as well. Uh, please do read the report. You can download it from the link um, at the University of Salford. And there's some there's our Twitter handle as well, followers for for updates. And also, if you've got any questions after this, we're going to deal with a few now. Um, there's Luke's email address to be able to fire questions. Well, thanks very much for that.